try to fall asleep. One of the most intriguing horror games I have come across in a while. When the first time it was released and a few people played it, I had my eye on it. It looked really interesting, but you can't really tell how good this game is unless until you play or experience it yourself. Today we'll be taking a look at Try to Fall Asleep's story, its characters, what does it mean, the dreams, the flea scenes, what's happening with the two main monsters. Fair warning, the game is still in early access, so we are covering only night one. Now without wasting any more time, let us begin. Try to fall asleep an indie horror game developed by Amber Drop. And just so you know, I played the early, early version like a long time ago of this game. So there has been some massive changes and upgrades afterward that you may find in the new version. But still, this game is in early access. This game was brought back into the conversation by game theorists Matt Pat, who has encouraged us, the entire horror gaming community here on YouTube, to talk about this. Because trust me, this one deserves it. Try to fall asleep has a weird way of telling its story. We play as John Heron whose main objective is, you guessed it, to fall asleep, or at least try to fall asleep. There's this two separate lines that we have to make clear reference to. There's this real world, where John Heron is trying to fall asleep, why, we'll come to that in just a second, and then there's other world, that's the pinnacle for the lore of this game. In the opening sequence before the start of actual night, and this is very important, we see a blast. Actually, we experience it. We see in front of our eyes, the entire building is on fire, and now the actual night begins, where we are greeted by a robotic voice known as AB. While we're lying down on our bed late at night, 10 p.m. to be exact, the objective is to fall asleep before 4 a.m. in the morning. AB, the robot, his job is to give assistance to patients that are experiencing mental breakdown down, psychotic dysfunctions, etc. His job is to help us, John Heron, to not only fall asleep before 4 a.m., but also assist him in his tough time and help him heal his wounds. What wounds? We'll come to that in just a second. The game plays out like a FNAF style camera. You have three views. Your left view gives you the opened door outside hallway view, which is terrifying. Your right side is where you see a lamp, which is important, the clock and the robot, AP. And the front view is the outside window where you see or are going to see some really interesting stuff. The way you play this part of the night is you have control panel on the bottom left corner where you see a stress meter and a sleep meter. Your goal is to fill that sleep meter before 4am or else things aren't gonna go well. In order to do that, you need to close your eyes by holding C. This will do some shady stuff, which we'll touch in a bit. But the more you close your eyes, the faster sleep meter will be filled and the quicker you will go to sleep. Sounds easy, right? Well, the only problem here is that there are some entities or anomalies around you that may prevent you from doing just that. Or let's just say that we are trying to make John get some sleep and rest to wake up fresh and heal quickly. But these entities are trying to make him sleep sleep permanently. Those entities are a part of John's hallucination. What hallucinations you may ask? Well, remember when I said in the beginning that the game starts with an explosion scene? Yeah, John Heron survived a massive, horrible tragedy. The explosion that we witnessed in the beginning, and unfortunately, even though he survived, he damaged his brain and lost his memory in a bad way that literally prevents him from sleeping normally. We are talking brain damage, prevention and sleep. The accident was so bad that it caused John John's brain so much damage, it literally doesn't allow him or itself to rest. That's why he's under a medication process. AB, his robotic assistant, was originally assigned by John's doctor, Dr. Rick Norberg, the only person that can help John other than John himself. Now, if that wasn't enough, that damage in his brain causes every type of hallucination in his brain, and he sees monsters roaming around from his past in the real world. And I believe it is important that we distinguish the real world from the dream world. And you may be wondering, what dream are you talking about? Well, when you're successfully fell asleep, you go into the dream world, just like in real life. But here in the dream world, the more you experience the dream, the more likely for you to rediscover the past and get your memory back and heal your damaged brain. However, falling asleep isn't all that easy. Remember when I mentioned stress meter? Yeah, this 
grows when you're trying to close your eyes. The more you close your eyes, the likely it'll cause hallucinations, and you guessed it, hallucinations causes monsters to appear around you. Now, to combat that, the player has to balance the gameplay between closing eyes and opening them before those monsters can get to you. However, seeing monsters for even a little bit causes stress meter to go up fast, and to avoid that, you need to turn on the lamp that will cause the stress to go down. However, the lamp itself is broken and it only runs for a few seconds. Your job is to use it wisely because if you let it run longer, it will overheat and break, leaving you no choice and no chance of recovering from stress, inevitably causing your hallucinations and monsters, ending it all for good. But who are these monsters? What happened to John that caused all of this? Why is he in the situation in the first place? Well, that's where the game gets even more interesting. You see, the players might see the opening sequence as a tutorial for how to play, but for us lore fans, it is such a significant part of the story. AB explains the current situation of John Heron that connects to his past and the second out of three parts we encounter in Night 1. First, AB congratulates John on how successfully he has recovered from all physical damages. That alone right there shows that the accident was brutal, but kudos to him and the doctors, he has successfully recovered. However, the brain damage is not something that's gonna be healed easily. According to our diagnosis, our brain injuries has caused memory losses and damages that leads us to hallucinate, which alone explains why we see those weird monsters even in real life. And there's a point that I haven't seen anyone mention. Yes, he does hallucinate, but only when he's trying to go to sleep or take rest or trying to heal. It makes sense. We as humans, our 80 to 95% of activities happens in the unconscious side. We're thinking constantly, thoughts, dreaming. We are barely present in the present moment. For us, it is always recommended to live the now every now and then. Unfortunately for John, well, he has to think, dream, and visit the past to heal. That's the only way to recover from damages he has suffered and still is suffering. Now, AB mentions that the easiest way to recover and heal is to sleep. Matthew from Game Theorist made a fantastic video on how sleeping works for brain in general. But from a game perspective, we got ourselves a motive, a purpose to experience a dream. And just when we thought that that's it, AB mentions something huge. That stress that we have to maintain whilst trying to fall asleep is crucial. It is literally the play of life and death. In Game Theorist's video, he talked about how so many cases have came into light about people falling to their death while literally sleeping. No sign of struggle, no nothing. Their hearts have suddenly stopped. They went to sleep, never woke up again. This is exactly what AB is warning us, that the stress alone could lead to our hearts stopping whilst we're sleeping, meaning death for no reason. In the game, of course, the monsters are doing just that. They're here, the hallucinations turn into monsters trying to stop our heart. Now, after falling asleep, finishing what AB instructed us to do, and overcoming our real-world hallucinations, it is time for the toughest part, the dreaming part, where we are trying to recover our lost memory or memories. This is where the game takes a very interesting part, and is also where I believe the game has made such a fantastic and fascinating decision. I'll explain what it is. In the dream world, you're back in the past, most specifically, you're back in the company called Revival. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. John and his group arrive late at night to check out in one of the most secretive labs of the Revival. It seemed as they've been a past or present employee at that point in dream of the said timeline. Like I said, we're covering night one content only in this video. You go around exploring the environment where a couple of things happen. One, you encounter those two monsters that you saw during your hallucination in real world, but here, they were more preserved, calm, almost like introducing themselves held back, whilst in real world, they were actively pursuing. Secondly, in order to power up that generator to get the lights working and getting back to our group, led by Kate, another employee or a friend, you would need five fuses that are scattered around both outside and inside the building. Whilst you roam around for the fuses, we finally learn about the two monsters we were encountering, and behold, this is huge information. Whilst searching for other stuff, we come across some letters showing that the people involved in this company, like John Heron himself, weren't exactly sure or happy on the ways Revival was doing things around here. They were kind of questioning the ethics or morals, not for the company, but for themselves, which we'll touch later. Each time you collect a fuse, you're locked in a maze with one of the two monsters. The objective is to flee. If you're playing it for the first time, you are going to die four to five times to understand what's going on but when you 
get a feel is the monster is endlessly chasing you in a maze and he keeps running at you there are no escape no exits just fleeing why well it is actually simple you're trying to puzzle back your past your memory and each time you collect an item it is helping you recover your memory and heal you rapidly hence the faster the quicker your approach to it is the faster the aggressive your past monstrous hallucinations are going to attack you for it and you have to fight and balance both because whether you like it or not both the monster the terrifying side and the normal side are a part of you and your memory now let's talk about the shady stuff revival wasn't just doing things wrong with employees no they were doing it wrong with everyone in the name of science ts 237 something we learn actively in the hallways of the lab it is one of many things that's wrong with this company but what is ts-237 well it is a highly explosive flammable toxic chemical gas compound that is used for quote-unquote study purposes in greenhouse to study its effects on nature and environment that alone goes to show you that revival is already some next level shady company but we haven't even touched the surface yet if you roam around even more you learn about the monsters you've been encountering one of the projects revival was working on was called murrix he was and i quote, a biological experiment that was created to help the local armors reduce rodents and other creature population in the crop fields. Moreover, the intent was to create a creature strong and intelligent enough that would obey its masters by command and hunt down the animals that were damaging the crops. Now these lines alone gives me the creeps and how insane their approach was. We don't need any shallow evidence as to why they were creating mergs in the first place. The line of obey its masters and hunt down the animals that were damaging the crops is already enough for us to know the revival's vision with these projects. They were doing shady stuff and wanted to protect it, even if it means hunting down and doing whatever possible to those that even think or even dream in their sleeps, no pun intended, to expose them. That was one of two monsters that we encountered in the main game. There was a bunch of stuff confirmed right there in the lab and most importantly was John and his group successful in exposing the dark truths and secrets of the revival to the world. Well, we will sure find out in the next episode when we explore more of Night 2 content and finish this game's mystery before its initial release. Ugh.